On Wednesday, Air Force Secretary Frank Kendall announced that the Next Generation Air Dominance Program is moving into the next stage of development, and they're now aiming to field America's next air superiority fighter by 2030. That is significantly faster than most fighter programs. Let's talk about what this means and what we already know about the NGAD. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. The Air Force's Next Generation Air Dominance, or NGAD, program is an experimental effort to field a crewed fighter along with drone support aircraft, and it's now begun its engineering, manufacturing, and development program, which will then lead into actual production. Now, as Frank Kendall noted, the Air Force really needs to speed up its processes to get this fighter into the sky in the time frame that they're looking at. Kendall's not wrong. On average, it takes the Air Force around seven years from the beginning of the EMD phase to the point where an aircraft reaches what's called initial operating capability, or is finally able to enter service even if in a limited way. The F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, for instance, had its EMD contract awarded in October of 2001, but the first F-35, the F-35B, didn't reach Initial Operating Capability, or IOC, until 2015. The F-35A followed in 2016, and the F-35C didn't reach IOC until 2019. Now, this time, Kendall wants the Air Force to move straight into development right away, fielding a new family of fighter systems within just eight years. This push to expedite the NGAD's development timeline is in keeping with reports that the program has been progressing very well, with at least one full-size technology demonstrator taking to the sky back in 2020. But the 2030 timeline also parallels statements made by the Air Force indicating that they're concerned the F-22 Raptor, which is America's current top-tier air superiority fighter, may not be survivable in contested airspace much beyond 2030. Despite boasting what is widely considered to be the smallest radar cross-section of any fighter in history, the F-22 is no spring chicken. The aircraft first flew a quarter century ago. The Air Force moved to retire nearly a fifth of its Raptor fleet earlier this year, opting to send its non-combat-coded Raptors out to pasture in favor of reallocating the funds toward modernizing the remaining 150 or so stealth fighters. The F-22 will likely still outclass any fighter it comes across by 2030, but it may not be survivable against modern integrated air defense systems that leverage new approaches like multi-static radar arrays. Despite widely being recognized as a program aimed at fielding a new family of fighter systems, to this point, NGAD has actually been an experimental effort rather than a production-oriented one. In other words, officially speaking, NGAD wasn't about fielding a new operational fighter so much as it was about testing technologies that could feasibly be incorporated into a new fighter. So this means these tests are going so well, NGAD is moving forward as a production fighter program. Now, the NGAD may be slated as a replacement for the F-22, but it's important to know that it very likely won't replace the F-22 in a one-to-one -one way. Today, the U.S. Air Force has around 150 combat-coded F-22s in service, but the NGAD program is very likely not going to replace them with 150 new crewed fighters. There's a few reasons for that. The first one being that the NGAD is going to be very expensive, at around $200 million per airframe, based on current estimates, but also because the NGAD fighter itself is designed to fly in concert with uncrewed wingmen, drones, that will fly support. In other words, one NGAD with a constellation of drones could feasibly fill the role that multiple F-22s with a pilot on board each would right now need to fill. Now, that can help reduce some of the sticker shock associated with that high acquisition cost of the NGAD. 
But there's another good reason why the NGAD program won't be looking to just purchase hundreds of new fighters, like we've seen in past programs. And that's really because NGAD isn't just changing how we approach air superiority, it's also changing how we approach the acquisition process itself. To better understand how, you should know that the earliest parts of the Joint Strike Fighter program that led to the F-35 started all the way back in 1993, with developmental contracts being awarded to Lockheed Martin and Boeing in 1996. Lockheed Martin's X-35 submission was named the Victor in October of 2001, and the first F-35 flight tests began in 2006. Fast forward to 2016, when the F-35's anticipated retirement was pushed back from 2064 to 2070. That means we expect the F-35 to stay in service for some 64 years after it first took flight. That exorbitantly long shelf life really comes in large part thanks to the huge cost of the F-35 program. It just has to last a long time in order to justify how much we're spending. But it also comes as a result of the Pentagon's traditional approach to fighter acquisitions. As Will Roper explained on more than one occasion, the Air Force is shifting away from half-century spanning fighters and instead towards short production runs of just 50 or 100 airframes that they expect to keep in service for just 12 to 15 years. That means having fresher fighter designs in service, newer technologies being fielded regularly, and importantly for the fiscally minded, a huge reduction in overall program costs. Back in July of 2021, the Government Accountability Office released an updated report on the F-35 program, and they estimated that its total anticipated cost will exceed $1.3 trillion. But of that figure, less than $400 billion represents the actual cost of buying the 2,456 jets Uncle Sam currently has on order. To put it another way, that means buying the F-35s only represents about 30% of the program's overall cost, with most of the remainder, 70% or so, all devoted to sustaining the platform or maintaining the aircraft through 50-plus years of service. By switching to more frequent fighter development programs, the force can field more advanced fighters that are better suited to counter the emerging threats of their day, all while dodging the vast majority of the expense associated with these sorts of programs. Initial procurement costs will very likely go up in the short term, but by taking a modular approach to both hardware and software architecture, systems that are not being replaced or updated can simply be migrated to the next fighter in development. This will dramatically reduce the time and costs associated with research and development for each new aircraft. But this move isn't just about cutting costs. The U.S. maintained a monopoly on operational stealth aircraft from 1983, when the F-117 first entered service in secret, all the way up until 2017, when China's Chengdu J-20 entered service. That three-decade lead has paid dividends, with America's stealth aircraft still considered to be significantly more difficult to detect than Russian or Chinese entries. But now that these nations are operating stealth platforms of their own, maintaining that edge will become more difficult. Not only are these nations rapidly developing new aircraft designs, they're also developing tactics and technologies meant specifically to counter America's stealth advantage, using their own platforms to achieve that. New integrated air defense systems sporting multi-static radar arrays, finely tuned low-band radar systems paired with infrared detection systems, and constantly improving surface-to-air missile technology all pose growing threats to America's stealth fleets. The F-35, sporting a stealth design that was largely finalized in the 1990s, might be extremely tough to detect in 2022, but it seems unlikely that its stealth will remain as effective in the 2060s. By swapping modular systems into improved designs, firms that are competing every 5 to 10 years for new fighter contracts can leverage the latest electronic warfare systems, the most advanced production materials, and the latest design elements to combat detection from the systems that are in service and on the horizon that day. 
rather than expecting today's technology to withstand five decades worth of enemy advancements. Now, another way NGAD is changing the acquisition game is that it's no longer a winner-take-all enterprise. Lockheed Martin's victory over Boeing for the Joint Strike Fighter contract granted it not only funding for the continued development of the fighter, but also for the production of the jet and then sustainment for as long as it stays in service. That gave Lockheed a great deal of leverage over establishing costs, and also left America's other primary fighter contractors without much reason to keep going on research and development on advanced fighter designs. After all, with more than 2,000 F-35s on order, why bother keep working on another fighter? According to Will Roper, that is not how NGAD's procurement will go. The Air Force has already split it into three separate contracts, one for design, one for production, and one for sustainment. What that means is that firms now have to compete not only to field the best fighter, but then they have to compete again to build them efficiently, and then they have to compete again to maintain them. This will also allow smaller firms to get into the fight, because there's not very many companies in the nation that have the infrastructure you need to design, produce, and maintain an entire fleet of advanced jets. Now firms can specialize in one thing. A small firm can compete for the design contract, while another firm can specialize in sustainment. In the years to come, we might see small companies become rock stars in these individual spaces, as big ideas get the opportunity to gain a foothold in the American fighter market. Honestly, not that unlike Kelly Johnson helped Lockheed do in the first place. In other words, NGAD could go on for decades, with a whole slew of different fighters being churned out as the Air Force crams new modular systems into the fuselages of the latest and greatest designs industry minds have to offer. But there is one more bombshell that we should discuss when it comes to NGAD, and that's that it may well not look anything like you're imagining. In October of 2020, the Congressional Research Service released a report on the NGAD program, and it included a lot of the information we've all become familiar with over the years. But one particular portion stands out as something few have discussed since. I'll quote it here. There appears little reason to assume that NGAD is going to yield a plane the size that one person sits in, and that goes out in dogfights kinetically, trying to outturn another plane, or that sensors and weapons have to be on the same aircraft. Now that alone isn't all that big a deal, but it's important to note that effectively what they're saying is that the NGAD fighter doesn't necessarily have to be a fighter at all. I'm going to quote the CRS report again. For example, a larger aircraft the size of a B-21 may not maneuver like a fighter, but that large an aircraft, carrying a directed energy weapon, with multiple engines making substantial electrical power for that weapon, could ensure no enemy flies in a large amount of airspace. That is air dominance. Now, what the CRS report is getting at is something that other Air Force officials have also said over the years. Back in 2017, General Herbert Hawk Carlyle, who was the commander of Air Combat Command at the time, was talking about a program called Penetrating Combat Aircraft, which was a precursor to NGAD. At the time, Carlyle suggested that America's next fighter might have a need for more substantial weapons capacity, fuel range, and low observability, saying that it may be more like the B-21 bomber than like the F-22. I'll quote him here. It may be bigger than we think. Maneuverability is one of those discussions, as in, if it's penetrating, what level of maneuverability does it need? We don't know the answer to that yet. All that is to say that air dominance doesn't necessarily have to look like dogfights as we might expect. As long as it can dominate the airspace, the Air Force is happy. But for now, we don't really know what the NGAD airframe will look like, nor do we know what its drone support aircraft will look like either. We may not know what it'll look like or even how big the NGAD will be, but we can be fairly confident that it will be a high performer. Back in 2020, when Will Roper announced that the NGAD program had already flown a full-size technology demonstrator, he said that it had, and I quote, broken a lot of records. 
Now we don't know which records he was talking about, but many have come to assume he meant service ceiling or maybe even top speed records. That would be pretty impressive, considering some of the incredible aircraft the United States has operated to date. And on that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure to swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.